coming up on New Center 16 at 5. The Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians has long been silent about its plans for a South Bend casino until now. The biggest threat is that we bring a, a real good brand and a real good product. Today, the tribal chairman talked one on one with our Mark Peterson. Plus, the virus that swept the Chicago area has reached the Hoosier State. Now, the number of dog flu cases here has grown. We're hearing from a local vet on why dog owners should turn to vaccination. Scammers have found a new way to target unsuspecting folks pretending to be from your popular stores. How to protect yourself from this new string of scams coming up. Another blustery and chilly day across the area. I'll let you know what's coming up next, coming up in uh, just a couple of minutes. From WNDU, your breaking news and weather authority, this is New Center 16 at 5. Another minority group feels that Indiana is not welcoming due to legislation pending before state lawmakers. Good evening, I'm Maureen McFadden. And I'm Terry McFadden. This time, the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi Indians is referring to a recently amended bill that deals with gaming. Mark Peterson joins us live in the studio. Mark, I assume this has to do with the tribe's plans to put a casino in South Bend. You know, Pokagons already have gaming facilities in Michigan, but they weren't the first tribe to build one there. By the time they got around to it, the process somewhat uh, familiar uh, routine. In Indiana, the exact opposite. The Pokagon facility would be the state's first tribal gaming facility and the Pokagon chairman today told me he feels state lawmakers there see the South Bend project as a threat to Indiana's existing casinos. Along those lines, there's a pending bill in the House would require the governor to negotiate specific items in a tribal gaming compact that deal with things like gaming management, gaming administration that go well beyond what is allowed by federal law. I, I think uh, Indiana has never done a native uh, done a compact with a tribe, and I think it's, it's so fearful for some of them. And you have to realize, uh, out of the 150 legislators, there's a lot of gaming interests, outside state interests, Nevada interests that's in the state of Indiana. And I think they're, they're very fearful of the unknown. And the legislators are fearful because I think they're only hearing one side of the story. This legislation is actually inhibiting the gov governor from negotiating good faith even before negotiations have begun. And the chairman says he feels final federal approval for the South Bend Casino project could come in the next 10 to 18 months if the governor uh, is somehow unable to negotiate a compact in good faith. The tribe may have to go directly to the Department of the Interior. It could uh, impose a compact with terms that it feels are favorable wouldn't be the first time. No, and you bring up the, the term good faith and a lot of right. people listen. Now exactly what would give the Pokagans a competitive advantage? Well, basically uh, in Indiana casinos are highly taxed, highly regulated. Uh, those wouldn't automatically apply to an Indian gaming facility unless they agreed to that in a compact. I mm -hmm. guess a lot of the state lawmakers there are certainly looking for leverage to try to make that happen. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks. Well, the dog flu epidemic has grown across a large part of northwest Indiana and Chicago. And while there isn't a specific dog flu vaccine, a local vet thinks it's better to try the vaccination than to go without. New Center 16 Sean Gallagher joins us now from the newsroom. And Sean, uh, will this vaccine guarantee protection for dogs? Well, Terry, no, but to be fair, no vaccination is 100% effective. This version of the dog flu is traced to the H3N2 strain, which is the first reporting outside of Asia. And while it's unknown if the current H3N8 vaccine could provide protection against this strain, one vet I spoke to says that it's worth the shot. The dog flu can be easily spread from direct contact, coughing, sneezing, or even people moving between infected and uninfected dogs. Statistics say almost all dogs exposed to the dog flu will become infected with 80% developing flu-like illnesses. For 3 to 8% of those dogs, things can be extremely severe and even fatal. And according to one veterinarian, this is a fairly safe vaccine and the benefits outweigh the risks. If it comes through here, uh, we'll have a lot of sick dogs. A lot of sick dogs. And I look at it this way, if I try and I fail, it's better than not trying at all. The immunity here in the United States for even canine influenza is very low because animals have not been actually exposed or very few have been exposed to that particular virus. The vaccine is relatively inexpensive. Dr. Langhofer says at his facility, it ranges from 25 to $55, but he suggests talking with your own vet 
to figure out what the best option is for you and your dog. All right, and Sean, I'm a dog owner myself. I'm sure I'm not alone in wondering, are there any ways to further protect your dog other than the vaccination? Right, well, obviously you wanna avoid visibly sick dogs. That's number one, but avoiding areas where dogs gather like dog parks or kennel, kennels helps. And be sure to wash your hands after handling any dog, but again, especially after handling a sick dog. All right, Sean Gallagher reporting live tonight from the newsroom. Sean, thanks. Well, a recent bill repealing Indiana's common construction wage law could affect local business in the future. Today, the South Bend Community School Corporation held a meeting discussing a new project to replace the roof at LaSalle Elementary. The project is estimated at over $350,000, so a committee determines the wage rates for public works construction projects. However, if the bill repeals the wage law, these meetings will be no more. Companies could select the workers based on the lowest bid in an open market instead of depending on union workers for these jobs. Some think this could mean a loss in both quality of work and wages. The more projects you use, sure you'll notice it, you know. People like the state or somebody doing large amounts of construction in a, in a year's time. Here we're not doing that much lately. I probably won't notice a whole lot because we don't do that many projects at this time because of our uh, funding issues. These are mostly union wages versus non-union wages or lower wages than what the union steadily pays. So I think over time you'll see a decrease in wages for these, some of these jobs. That's a possibility. Now, supporters of the bill argue wages are set artificially high, hindering the competitive market from lowering bid prices and saving taxpayers money. Well, the sun's been out today, but it's been a chilly one. Mike, how low do you expect those temps to drop tonight? Terry, we're looking for temperatures to drop well into the 30s tonight once again, and uh, we're going to be watching that. But right now, we're watching some uh, spotty light showers moving into our northern and western sections, as you can see there. Those will continue to move by. They'll be generally brief and generally just enough to uh, wet the ground in most of Michigan. Off to the north, a little bit more substantial rain and snow showers. Northern Michigan, northern Wisconsin getting both of those. Hour by hour forecast as we head through the evening. Uh, there will be a shower or two in most areas. Very light though. Temperatures down to 45 degrees by 9 o'clock. I'll let you know how cold it gets later tonight coming up with my forecast. Thank you, Mike. 13 days after finding him guilty on all 30 counts he faced in the Marathon bombing attack this morning, the jury returned to the federal courthouse in Boston with only one question remaining in the case. Should Johar Sarnayev live or die? Here's Jay Gray with the details. Now, if that decision is the death penalty, it must be a unanimous vote. If not, the sentence will automatically shift to life in prison. Now to a controversial decision facing a judge this week. Should John Hinckley Jr., the man who shot President Reagan, be granted more time away from the mental hospital where he's been treated for more than 30 years? John Hinckley Jr. was 25 when he tried to assassinate President Ronald Reagan, and he's now nearing 60. Over the years, a federal judge has gradually granted Hinckley longer visits to his mother's home in Williamsburg, Virginia, and away from the mental institution in Washington, D.C. Tomorrow, hearings will begin again to determine if Hinckley should be allowed even more time in Williamsburg and the possibility of living there permanently. His doctors are expected to argue his mental illness is under control, but the federal government strongly disagrees. Meanwhile, a vote to confirm Attorney General nominee Loretta Lynch is expected in the coming days, this after a five-month stall over an anti-human trafficking bill. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell announced today a bipartisan deal had been reached on the bill, clearing the way for a vote on Lynch's nomination. If confirmed, Lynch would be the first African-American woman to hold the office of Attorney General. A recurring scam is popping up in Michigan once again, this time with a new twist. Scammers are targeting email accounts, promising reward points to popular stores like Macy's and Walgreens if you answer a survey. Now, the body of the email says you've been selected to complete a survey about recent customer service. And there's a link within the email to supposedly direct you to that survey. It says once you finish it, uh, you'll get reward points to spend at the store. Now, if you click it, it may actually uh, take you to a survey, but will also prompt you to purchase spam products or ask for bank information, or it may even download malware to your computer. They want you to act right now, and, and they bait you with something that seems worthwhile. You get $100 worth of points. So, again, not only you can check it out with us, you have any doubt it happened to be a store that you're already doing business with, make a phone call to that store and ask them, are you really doing this? 
As a general rule of thumb, it's never a good idea to click a link within an email that is unsolicited. Now, if you have questions or would like to contact the Better Business Bureau, you can call the number on your screen, 675-9351. That's where you can also report a scam. We also put a link on the big red bar. Let's face it, eating healthy as adults can be extremely challenging, and when it comes to your kids, it can be even harder. This morning, News Center 16's Christine Karsten met up with the cast of Jump with Jill and learned how they're working to make nutrition fun. This cast will head to three other elementary schools in Mishawaka, Emmons, LaSalle, and Battelle before continuing their Midwest tour. For more information, or if you want to jump with Jill to come to your school, we have a link to their website on ours. Just click on this story. More to come on New Center 16. Theory debunked. With the help of 95,000 kids, scientists are finding there's no link between the measles vaccine and autism. We're breaking down the study. Plus, it's a serious illness that claims more lives than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS combined. In today's medical moment, we're shedding light on sepsis. You're watching WNDU, your breaking news and weather authority. New Center 16 at 5. Tracking weather with an hour by hour forecast. Storm Team 16 is your weather authority. And it's time for our first uh, weather radio programming day. It comes up Wednesday, which is tomorrow, 5 to 7 p.m. at uh, four different Walgreens locations across our area. We have a couple of more planned. We'll let you know when those are. Mishawaka, Maine and McKinley, Niles, 11th Street and Silverbrook uh, in Goshen on the corner of Pike in Chicago and the Michigan Street Plymouth Walgreens store tomorrow. We'll obviously be talking more about that during the uh, show tomorrow evening. There's our WNDU uh, station Skyview camera and you can see it's 54 degrees and the wind is just blowing our camera around all over the place. I'm sure it's brought some small twigs down in many neighborhoods across the area because we've seen gusts as high as 51 miles per hour in Goshen, the highest in South Bend was 44 miles per hour. Right now, westerly wind at 25, still gusting 35 to 40, though, in most hours. Uh, very dry air out there. Temperatures, as you can see, middle 50s until you get into a southwest Michigan downwind from the lake. It's only in the mid 40s at this hour, so chilly weather continues and a few spotty showers starting to come in. Looks like most of us will get at least some sprinkles and perhaps a brief shower or two in most areas. And you can see we're on the southern edge of a much wetter situation off to the north, even some snow flying up across the central and northern portions of Michigan. Here's what the future looks like with 16 Future Track. The secondary cold front will push on through. That means it's going to be colder than it has been tonight and tomorrow. While Future Track not impressed with anything, later on tonight from 3 a.m. on, it is showing that possibility for a little bit of a snowflake activity, especially tomorrow morning now. You can see there's 9 a.m showing some snow showers mainly uh, east to South Bend. So anybody could see some flakes of snow tomorrow, but that should move off to the east and we'll begin to see partly sunny skies into the evening hours. Future track showing a sprinkle perhaps tomorrow evening. We don't really have that in the forecast at this point. Either way, though, it begins to clear off tomorrow night, and that means frosty conditions in parts of Michiana by Thursday morning. High pressure builds in after that, and that means more and more sunshine as we head through the day Thursday. The next system we'll have to watch. Most of that, though, is going by to the south of us early in the weekend. Here's my Storm Team 16 forecast for all of Michiana for tonight. A brief shower or two, maybe later tonight, some flakes of snow mixed in in places, low down to 34. Seven-day planning forecast. Again, those flakes could last into tomorrow morning. Then partly sunny after lunchtime, breezy and chilly, high of 47. We'll still call it a green day because any flakes of snow won't be a big deal. Areas of frost Thursday morning, otherwise bright sunshine, high of 49, and a third green day in a row. Even though it's chilly out there, frost likely in the morning, partly sunny and 54 by afternoon. And the rest of the seven-day forecast shows temperatures generally in the 50s as we head through the rest of the weekend. A uh, pretty good possibility for some rain coming in early next week. And there is a possibility of a shower or two on Saturday now with a high of 52 degrees. So uh, kind of chilly weather for this time of the year, and it's here to stay at least for 8 to 10 days. Yeah, this past weekend was just beautiful. It though. was. Saturday it would, was awesome. It would have been nice <laughs> to have that just continue. Yeah, no but. kidding. All right, Mike, thanks a lot. Well, in the late 90s, a British researcher published a paper linking autism to the measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR vaccine. Well, that paper was later found to be fraudulent. Mm -hmm. The researcher discredited and stripped of his medical license. But the frightening idea stuck in parents' heads, who still worry despite more than a dozen other studies debunking any link between autism and vaccines. Well, tonight, Erica Edwards reports on yet another study that may offer additional reassurance. 
And if you'd like to read the research yourself, it's published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and we have a link on the big red bar. A day after hundreds celebrated a day known for pot smoking, a new poll shows that while two-thirds of Americans support the use of medical marijuana, only half of those believe it should be allowed for children. Eighty percent of people surveyed said adults shouldn't be allowed to use the drug in front of kids. Right now, medical marijuana laws vary across the country. Colorado permits a special strain for children's use, while for the most part, parents can lose custody rights if they allow their kids to use it. More to come. It's one of the top three killers in the U.S., and you may never have even heard of it. Next in today's Medical Moment, a survivor shares her story. Stay tuned. The latest health news for you and your family. This is Maureen's Medical Moment. A deadly infection is claiming lives, but most have never heard of it. What you need to know in today's Medical Moment. Sepsis claims the lives of more people every year than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS combined. Every two minutes, someone in the U.S. dies of the deadly condition. If you don't know much about it, you're not alone. Now victims and doctors are speaking out to raise awareness. Warm memories come flooding back each time Doreen Betancourt looks through her scrapbook. All the, the pieces I can still capture, even though they're gone, I still have them in a book. They were moments yeah. Doreen nearly lost when a routine surgery to have a cyst removed nearly killed her. My whole body was shaking. Nurses were trying to hold my arm to get arterial blood gas out of me. Doreen's organs were shutting down. She was in septic shock. Dr. Nathan Shapiro says the severe inflammatory response can be caused by any infection. It can be anywhere. It could be a skin infection, pneumonia, urinary tract infection. It doesn't really matter what kind of infection. And this um, gross amount of inflammation really causes the body almost to turn upon itself. A sepsis survivor himself, Dr. Shapiro says diagnosing the condition early can mean faster treatments and better outcomes for patients. Warning signs include fever, nausea, and elevated heart rate, confusion, and difficulty breathing. They couldn't tell my mother for a whole month if I was going to live or die. Doreen spent 55 days in the hospital, most of them on an IV while she waited for her wound to heal. They had to leave me open like hip to hip to heal from the inside out. You know, the pain, I'll never forget the pain that I was in. Now she's made a near full recovery and has become a nurse and sepsis advocate, hoping to help others have a chance to make more memories too. Every year, severe sepsis strikes more than a million Americans. The survival rate for those in septic shock hovers around 50%. Typically, doctors treat the condition with antibiotics, but other therapies like oxygen, intravenous fluids, dialysis, mechanical ventilation, or surgery are also used. And to read the research summary for today's story, you can go to WNDU.com and click on the Medical Moment. Terry? Thanks, Mo. More to come. Love was in the air at this year's Boston Marathon. See how one runner had a sparkly gift waiting for her at the end of a three hour and 41 minute run. Stay tuned. One Boston Marathon runner got a medal and a diamond after running the race. Runner Daniel Eric Coe proposed to his girlfriend Amy Sennett yesterday after the two crossed the finish line. And the mayor of Boston even had a hand in the proposal. He held the ring while the engaged couple finished the race. Coe says he's been working on the proposal since last year, and in case there was any doubt, Senate said yes, of course. New Center 16 at 530 is next with Mo. Here's a preview. Coming up on New Center.